Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Cadence with Matt Graham. We're going to talk today about how to improve the productivity of verification using AI. Matt, designs are becoming much more complicated. Verification obviously is 70 to 80 percent of the time it takes to produce a design before it goes to manufacturing. What can be done to speed this up? How does AI fit into the picture? Well, a lot of that 70 to 80 percent is in sort of manual the tedium, you know, things like debugging, checking specs, et cetera. We think there's an opportunity for AI to help improve the productivity, kind of catalyze the engineer, make the engineer more productive and remove some of that tedium. And as you do that, you're also dealing with things like heterogeneous integration. You've got more chips that are coming in here. So you're no longer just verifying one thing, right? You're verifying things in a package. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, certainly multi-chip and 3D IC, et cetera, are going to just increase the amount of data that we have. And a lot of data is actually a good thing for AI. And so while humans struggle to consume and analyze all that data, machines and AI and ML algorithms are, are really good at it. So again, a really great opportunity to apply that. Let's take a closer look. Sure. So Matt, where do you start with this? Where does AI fit in and how early does it start in the design process? What we're finding in some of the proof of concepts that we're doing, especially around large language models and, and using concepts like ChatGPT, we're not using ChatGPT, but concepts like that is really as early as the spec and architecture phase, where you're looking at these specifications and spending a lot of time kind of reviewing them and understanding, are they complete? And we think that like large language models and natural language processing show a great deal of promise here to, to give the engineer some feedback like, is this a good spec? Does it appear complete? How much verification are you going to have to do on a spec like this? And start to predict those kind of things even before you've gotten into the writing the RTL and the test bench phase. So you've got a lot of data. Is really what you're doing here picking patterns out of that or are you doing more? Uh, well, I mean, AI and ML is, is at it fundamental layer kind of pattern recognition, if you like. And, and uh, I'm sure there's some AI or ML engineers out there screaming into their computer going, no, it's not, you don't understand. And, I, and I'm not an AI, ML sort of, you know, PhD level guru by any stretch of the imagination. But what we are is doing a lot of learning on whatever data we have, be it natural language data or data coming out of the design process like RTL and test bench code, or even the data we're generating as part of the verification flow, like log files, waveforms coverage. And, and there's, there's tons of data like that. And what we want to be able to do is analyze that. And yeah, maybe it's fine patterns. Maybe it's looking for correlations that we wouldn't have made, you know, or the human brain, we just don't have enough capacity to see all the different ways that data are relating to each other. And in a fundamental way, what the patterns are, what is this particular pattern of input or language structure or whatever pointing us to down the road in terms of what the RTL is going to look like or what kind of bugs we might find or what kind of coverage we're going to achieve. Is this an overlay of what's already been in use? So if I'm a design engineer do I, or a verification engineer, do I need to learn something completely new or is this pretty much, I already know what's going on here, I know how to use it, this just becomes an additional way of, of leveraging it? Well, that's a great question. And I think that there's a couple of ways to look at that, the, the answer, or, or maybe there's two answers is a better way to say it. First of all, we don't see replacing things like the simulator or the formal engine. So for Cadence, that's Excelium or Jasper. We're not replacing those with AI. Those fundamental engines will continue to be the workhorses of verification. The same is true in implementation and so on. What we do see is the ability to augment, kind of catalyze the engineer. So take the data that those things are generating and do something interesting with it, analyze it in some way, especially the data we're not looking at today. So in the case of debugging, you know, all the passing simulations, you don't go look at the log files from the passing simulations and try and understand uh, what's going on there. You typically will focus, an engineer will focus in on what's in the failing simulation. Now, in terms of learning a new tool, uh, I think not so much, but learning a new method of work. And I'll tie it back to something very simple. I have teenage kids and they're doing homework and so on. And, and when I was sitting and doing homework with one of them, uh, it was a, you know, 47 times 83 kind of, of number. And I get my phone out, open the calculator app and try and do the numbers. And my, uh, my son goes, hey, uh, Alexa, what's 47 times 83 or whatever it was. And of course, the, the answer comes back before I can get my calculator app out. And so I think there's going to be that same kind of shift with, with engineers where instead of diving in and looking at, you know, every line in the log file and using grep or whatever, they're going to want to go and, and ask some of our AI capabilities, like the Verisium platform, for example, to give it back, to give back to the engineer some insights before diving into that, to that nitty gritty. And so it's going to be a bit of a shift in terms of what tooling do you use and when. 
When I think about AI, one of the issues that always comes up is how much accuracy, precision do you need? Does that fit in here as well? Do you have results that don't need that much accuracy as well as those that do? Uh, yeah, that's absolutely the case. So first of all, in verification, we have now for the first time the concept of quality of results, right? Because certainly an AI algorithm can come back and say, you know, the root cause of your bug is here. If we don't have enough data, or we haven't trained well enough or whatever, certainly you could get data that wasn't as helpful. Certainly there's an aspect of accuracy in all of this. But by the same token, we're not looking for deterministic 100% solutions, uh, at least not at this point. Where we see a, a big opportunity is to get the engineer 80, 90% of the way there. And, and our early customers that have been using some of the stuff in, in our Jedi platform, and, and like I said, in the Verisium suite of applications and, and tools, is you know as much as an order of magnitude in, improvement in productivity, but not 100%. We're not eliminating engi any engineers. What we're trying to do is make the ones that are there more productive. So certainly, you know, there is an accuracy, and it's certainly not 100% yet. This has another element to it as well, which is as you get into these complex systems and as you're going domain-specific designs, you want to be able to slot in different pieces, right? So now you can say, okay, we're going to try this one out. This one works. This one works better than this one. Let's use this one. Do you see AI applying there as well? And if so, what's the implication on the verification cycle? Because that typically is the longest, hardest part. And in the past, if you did one thing and you added something else, you had to redo the whole thing over again. So a lot of the area that we've been able to apply AI is in that kind of differential area. So we have something, we've changed it in some way. What's the meaning of the Delta? Certainly something like TK diff can tell us, you know, raw number of characters that have changed in a source code file. But what does that really mean in terms of the design, the amount of effort that might be required, et cetera? First of all, we've got some proof of concept where, you know, AI in particular things like LLMs can help extract out of that. Here's the amount of change that you might have introduced. We have some other areas where we're applying AI kind of at the compiled artifact level. So once we've sort of parsed and compiled RTL or a test bench, what is the amount of real behavior that's going to change without having to deterministically say, this is the exact behavior that will change, but more statistically, what behavior is going to change? There's one other example. You mentioned something about basically as designs are getting more complex, how do we choose the right paths? That's an area where we've got AI all the way down in the engine itself in terms of our formal tool. And in Jasper, we're using AI to help us choose which of the different algorithms Jasper has implemented in terms of formal proof solutions is going to be the most effective. So rather than randomly choosing or using some deterministic algorithm, we can use some statistical algorithms to help us improve the throughput all the way down in the guts of the core tool. As you get into different packaging, as you get into different foundries on different processes, you've got all sorts of different variables here that you didn't have before. What changes in terms of the verification and how does AI fit in there? Well, I think the biggest impact on verification is probably just as we go to smaller nodes, we're getting, you know, larger and larger complexities. There's niche sections of verification that get heavily impacted by the foundry. But, you know, I think the biggest impact is just the raw size. You know, certainly when we, we double the gate count, we square the state space, which means we increase exponentially the verification problem. Now, that being said, I think it, with AI, we have the opportunity to fetch out of the implementation phase some of that information and sort of shift it left into the verification phase to where data that we weren't considering before could be pulled into the verification flow and vice versa, right? We can maybe start to fetch out of the verification flow more waveform data, more toggle data, et cetera, in helping to understand power effects and so on and so forth. So really, I think the impact there that AI can have is just broadening the, the scope and horizon of data that we can use at different parts of the flow, and that's going to help us just shift left in general. Does it also help when you get to an ECO where you have one change that comes in late in the design cycle and you go, okay, now we've done all this work, do we have to redo it all? Or does whatever you've accomplished there in terms of debugging, verifying what's there, does that easily transfer over to the new, here's the change that has to be implemented? Certainly the potential is there. That's an area where I would say we have active research ongoing, and I don't know that we've gotten to a solution or, or to something that's you know, a viable app at, at this point. But certainly we see the opportunity, again, with you know, our, our joint enterprise data and AI or JEDI platform, where we want to take all that data and store it in a kind of a central place. That ECO is one of the areas where we have an opportunity to really, you know, like you say, leverage all that data we've done before. We've done this work before. How can we you know, statistically draw on that and understand, well, yeah, there's, here's this debug that we've done in the past, or here's these simulations we've run in the past, and here's the, the little bit that's going to change. But certainly that's an area we're looking into. I know 
nothing you know super concrete at this point. As engineers use this, what sort of problems do they typically run into and how do they get resolved? The biggest problem is that this is a new area of, of, of research, a new area of development, and so as a result, we're still in the learning phase of where this is applicable. AI and ML is not universally applicable across the spectrum. Certainly, one of the key things that we need to understand is that AI and ML can only do what it's learned. So if you've never solved a particular kind of bug, or if you've never you know, uh, gotten into a particular corner of the design, AI is not going to tell you by default, at least not the way that it's working today, oh, this is how you get into that corner. And so I think engineers, their biggest problem is expecting it to be kind of a deterministic solution and not appreciating that it needs to learn something. And then once it's learned it, it can help you get back into that corner. So in terms of the actual technical challenges, it's just about dealing with the amount of data that, that we need to store and keep and how to do that efficiently but also at what point are we trained effectively and so on. And those times are quite short, but really just, I guess, patience is a little bit of, of what's required at this point. So what comes next? Where do you see this going over the long term? Is it just going to be a tool? Is it going to be a, this is my buddy, I'm going to be working with this just same way I would the rest of the team? How do you see this rolling out? That's an interesting question. I think, you know, we're at the very beginning of this, right? But this is, this is a decade away from from totally changing what we do. And we're gonna see this incremental changes over time. Now, I think it has value. I think it has real use today, but I think we're gonna look back in a decade and see that it's completely changed the way that we, we you know, design and verify ICs. In the same way that AI and ML under the hood, in, uh, internet search has completely changed the way that we interact with search. We think about you know, whatever brand name from you know, a decade or two ago, and how we used to go about internet searches, we've, we've completely changed how we, we interact with that. At the 10,000 foot view, it's still giving you an answer, but it's giving a much better answer and so on. So I think we're gonna see the same thing in verification. It will be all of the things that you mentioned. It'll be your buddy, it'll be another tool. It will be some automation under the hood that you don't even realize is there and is just giving you better results. And is the goal here to shorten the time that you're actually in verification or is it to improve the results of what comes out of verification? It's both of those things. I think. Really, the key ask that our customers have is overall productivity and throughput. And they're seeing you know, a 10x or more increase in complexity. They're not able to hire certainly 10x engineers, and we're seeing more design starts on top of that. There's really a talent, a resource gap there that we need to fill. The key is going to be productivity, I think, and that's going to be the big payoff. What kinds of issues are your customers running into, and where are they seeing better results? So our customers, of course, we are working with some, some great early partners. They've been outstanding collaborators in terms of working with us to define some of the algorithms and the problems they're trying to solve. I think the biggest result that they're seeing is as much as of a 10x or sometimes as much as 50 or 60x gain in productivity in specific cases. Where they're struggling, like I'd said before, is, is it applicable in every single case? And certainly we're applicable in, in specific cases. For debug, it's regression debug, for example. We see a great results when something was passing and it's now started failing because whatever reason we've introduced some sort of error. And that's where we see the multiple orders of magnitude improvement in, in productivity. Where it still has yet to, to go is in that, like I said, we haven't learned what we haven't learned yet. So as we get more designs, we tape out two, three, four designs with our, with our tools, we're going to learn more about what kind of design patterns, what kind of error patterns show up, and where the tools can, can help say, you know, look in your last chip this XYZ happened, we can now see that in this new chip, that XYZ pattern is happening again. This is what you did to debug it last time. Are you getting the necessary feedback in order to be able to modify your algorithms? Because something like 35% of the complex designs being done today are being done by system companies that are used internally. You never actually see that data. Absolutely. So this is a challenge in terms of us developing the tools, right? We're not asking for the data back from our customers. We're developing algorithms that are going to be able to train quickly on site at the customer. So we're not uploading data to the cloud. We're not doing any of that kind of stuff. We're developing the tools that leave the data resident at the customer. Uh, what we are getting is great collaboration where our customers are saying, look, we tried to apply XYZ tool, parts of Verisium, parts of Jedi to a particular problem. It didn't give us as much feedback as we would have liked. It didn't give us as much improvement as we would have liked. And we can go in and work with them to improve how we learn and how we leverage the data once it's in the model. And you also want a full closed loop here too, right? You really want to go all the way out into the field and go, okay, how did this work over time? And then I need this data back. Go out into the field in the same way that traditionally we have an EDA and that we go run a tool, we see how it runs. We look at what's going on in the customer's environment, in the customer's design, and we tweak the tool 
to optimize for whatever problem they might be trying to solve. We're doing the same thing here. So we're not really getting data back in terms of the real data, but the feedback back. And certainly we do want to get this out in the field. That's our main goal kind of at this point is we just want to see more miles because we need miles on this kind of solution to be able to refine it and to optimize it and get it to, like I say, learn and converge as quickly as possible. How do you see this playing into some of the other platforms, things like emulation and prototyping? Emulation and prototyping in particular are generating a lot of the same kinds of data, logs, waves, et cetera. And so certainly a lot of the capabilities that we can use for either simulation or formal, we can absolutely use for prototyping and, and emulation. It's only going to uh, be more substantial at, at emulation and prototyping just because, you know, the speeds are higher, the amount of data we're generating can be significantly greater. So certainly that's going to help the engineer go through all that data and, and analyze it and be more effective. It's also, again, going to help us shift even further left. Prototyping and emulation are helping us, you know, pull software verification left pre-silicon so that the more we can do that, the more we're going to shift more and more of that left into the pre-silicon phase. And that's going to help our customers, you know, again, productivity and quality. How resource intensive is this? Do you need to be in the cloud? Can you do it on your own site? I mean, what, what are we looking at here for the customer? We know that our customers don't have farms full of GPUs, at least not yet. And not all of them want to go out or even are able to go out to the cloud and, and address millions of instances. So certainly some of our applications we're looking at can they run on a very few cores and do something useful? Maybe not answer the whole question end to end, but do something very useful, implement some relatively simple AI algorithms and give back a, a meaningful result to the, to the user. Now, when we talk about things like large language models and natural language processing and sort of chatbot type things, and yeah, those are going to be more resource intensive and maybe those are only able to be de deployed on the cloud or when a user has a big set of resources at their disposal. So it really runs the gamut. And one of our challenges certainly is to build solutions that are both innovative and leveraging all of that capability, but also deployable by our customers in the near term. Matt Graham, thanks for a very interesting conversation. Thanks, Ed.